if the goal of the paper is to, to unsettle a certain degree of dogmatism, I'm, I am unsettled, and, and I'm, I'm persuaded in that sense. But I, I, I do have um, uh, two objections uh, to the paper, or at least, or at least challenges. Uh, the first is the, um, uh, the treatment of the original meaning um, as, as not being particularly determinate on its own terms. Um, in, in reading your paper, I started thinking to myself, this is a constitution for the United States of America that we're expounding. And the constitution for a pre-existing United States of America has a context of a um, violent war to protect local self-government. Uh, these are people that seem to be very, very interested in um, not yielding a lot of things to a central power. And a constitution written by and for, by its own terms, the preamble, by, by that people, um, the context there would suggest that they're not going to be um, choosing to surrender entirely that tradition. Um, and I think that creates a pretty strong presumption from within the text itself that the, this constitution for this United States of America is, um, uh, is one of, of limited powers. Um, which makes those reassurances all the more persuasive uh, made by the Federalists. We're, 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 doing, we're, doing this con we're, we're writing a constitution for us, for you, in the way that you would think it would, we would do. Um, the second objection is, is uh, the, the racial question. Um, you mentioned that as the big exception. And um, that's not really an exception because the Prigg case is a big case where the anti-slavery people were the most uh, anti-federal uh, power and wanted a very strict enumeration. In fact, that's probably one of the biggest um, um, federalism qu questions in the United States. Certainly, it's the it's the most um, occasion, the most violent controversy in antebellum America besides Dred Scott. Um, so there, the enumerationists were on the side of uh, racial justice, and that, that that should be part of that story if you're going to include that story. I think I have an evidentiary question again, and is an evidentiary question within the frame of the originalism framework as you're as you're approaching it, original public meaning and whatnot. Um, I, as I understand it, and this is a dynamic I've seen in other areas that I'm even more familiar with. There's language from the ratification debates, talking scary talk about the Constitution from anti-federalists, that is then rejected or argued against by. Federalists in the course of making reassurances to um, uh, you know to secure to secure ratification. Surely, sometimes scary predictions could be well-grounded, thoughtful evaluations of genuinely possible interpretations. Surely, other times they could just be wildly implausible, bad legal arguments, wrong, etc. Right? People lie about what's in bills. Um, sometimes if you follow a course of conversation, it looks like it's close. Sometimes if you follow a course of conversation, like it ends with the side that was making crazy arguments, not making them anymore. How do you think about, and I think you concede this, minority statements running up to the adoption of a text, um, reaching a level of sufficient evidence so that in your framework, in the framework you're operating in, that pushes us, sorry, pushes us into the, whatever, the construction zone, um, so that you can then not worry so much about what the best reading is at that point and turn to other considerations besides just thinking about the historical answer. So I, th I think that Professor Barnett uh, maybe already touched on this, but I I'm kind of wondering maybe a, a more direct response to the, a simplified version of it. Um, because I've always understood the Federalists and Anti-Federalists to kind of form a fitting set with respect to enumerated powers. Um, you seem to kind of give more weight to the Anti-Federalist fears and the plausibility of their arguments than to the Federalist representations and acquiescence. Um, but it seems like it's the Constitution's unveiled, and then you have the Anti-Federalists that look at the clauses and say, you know, this is going to be, you know, a, a general, there's going to be a general legislative power here. There's not going to be any limited and enumerated powers. And the Federalists respond with a kind of sophisticated limited and enumerated power structure argument, and then there's acquiescence. And it seems like the, the anti-federalist concerns, the federalist responses, the acquiescence that as just a general matter, that liquidates or that fixes or that um, explains the limited and enumerated power structure. Um, second, um, you, you make an argument that our official story is one of 
sort of general legislative powers, the power of the federal government to always respond to any crises. And I, kind of carrying Barnett, uh, Professor Barnett's story forward from McCulloch, and he laid out uh, the limited enumerated powers in the early republic, the uh, evidentiary points for limited enumerated powers. It seems like up until the New Deal, there is a largely a consensus that commerce is something different than agriculture and manufacturing, and that agriculture and manufacturing are, are for local regulation as well as just normal property, and that um, and that not, it's not until the New Deal that there's more general legislative power and commerce means something much broader. Um, and I'm wondering why that is why that is not the official story, and it's not until the New Deal that there's this kind of uh, breakdown in the limited enumerated power structure and that division between uh, local law and agriculture and uh, manufacturing and commerce. So thank you so much for your paper and um, for your remarks, Professor Barnett. What if the anti-federalists are making crazy arguments? Um, and how do you, how do you deal with those? And then a related question, I guess, uh, the, the third speaker, and I'm sorry, I, I missed, uh, your name, uh, that we seem to be giving more weight to the anti-federalist fears than the federalist, um, reassurances. Um, so we have more evidence about what the federalists thought, um, in their moments of candor, because we have, you know, we have, uh, Madison's notes and some other notes of the, constitutional convention debates and we have other pre-convention writings uh, from madison and others about what they wanted this constitution to do um and those you know those pre-ratification utterances at the convention and before were made in context in a context of greater candor um the ratif- the the constitutional convention was held in secret precisely because they didn't want to have to pull their punches so much because you know, if everything they had said would have been public. Um, once they get into the public arena, then they're speaking more strategically. And we see a lot of divergence between what anti, what, what, um, Federalists said before and during the convention and what they said in the ratification debates. And in the specific case of James Wilson in the Chisholm, uh, case, he reverts back to, his more nationalist pronouncements and contradict some of the things that he said, uh, some of the important things that he said in the ratification debates. Um, so we have evidence to, uh, to heavily discount, um, what the, uh, uh, what the Federalists said. The very fact that they called themselves Federalists is a reason for a substantial discount. During the Constitutional Convention, all of the framers, this is a running theme throughout Madison's notes, that the Constitution was a national, creating a national government. And they use the term federal and federal government to refer to the confederation and a weak association of states rather than a national government that could act directly on the people. From the very first day in the Virginia plan, they use the word national nine times to describe different aspects of the Virginia plan to the very last day of the convention when Governor Morris says, hey, you know, going forward into the public now, the big question for us is, are we going to have a national government or not? So they're nationalists. And then in one of the most Orwellian branding coups of all time, they call themselves federalists uh, for this debate, leaving the true federalists without a label. And, and we, history has come to call them anti-federalists. So, you know, they were dissimulating like crazy. We don't have as much evidence, uh, of what anti-federalists thought in private, but we have a little bit. And, you know, you look at private letters, for example, between, uh, Richard Henry Lee and, uh, 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 Samuel Adams. And they're saying the same things in private letters as they're saying in public. So that's why I think, you know, I, I think there's certainly more to explore here. But I think the early returns on, on evidentiary analysis are suggesting that the anti-federalists were speaking more sincerely in their fears than federalists were in their reassurances. Um, and, you know, just to answer Julian's point, um, were the anti-federalists making crazy arguments? If, you know, if we're right, and I think we are, about this, the ambiguity of the semantic meaning, what does the what general welfare clause mean? Madison himself recognized that the most natural reading of the general welfare clause was a general legislative power. Then how crazy really is 
uh, what the anti-federalists were saying. It actually is, they are plausible interpretations of language that we can see today and read in the same way if we take away our confirmation bias. I think Julian is exactly right in theory. Uh, it's certainly possible uh, that uh, one side uh, of any debate uh, is uh, making implausible claims, claims that have been recognized universally as implausible in their context. Uh, but I think a holistic analysis for many of the reasons that David has mentioned and other reasons that we articulate in the paper uh, of the ratification debate suggests that that was not, in fact, what was going on here. Uh, in response to uh, Adam's uh, suggestion that what we get at the end of the debate is some kind of synthesis or acquiescence uh, in which uh, all parties to the debate accept uh, the Federalist representations that the Constitution is, in fact, the enumerationist. I just think that the evidence isn't remotely clear uh, on that point. Uh, there are all kinds of indications uh, that uh, opponents or skeptics of the Constitution had lingering concerns. Uh, the statements of forms of ratification uh, uh, in which Various states uh, demand additional clarification, suggest that there was ongoing worry uh, that the federal government would not, in fact, be confined to the uh, to the powers expressly uh, enumerated, uh, and that further clarification was necessary on that point, which the states ultimately don't get um, uh, when uh, the Tenth Amendment uh, makes its way through Congress. The word ex expressly is, is stripped out. Um, in response to David's first suggestion uh, about uh, the uh, background context of the Revolutionary War uh, and uh, the uh, the strong resistance to central uh, control being part of the background context. Uh, I think that certainly is part of the background context, but it strikes me as a very general uh, feature uh, of that context, and we have a lot uh, of uh, much more uh, specific contextual evidence discussed in the paper that speaks uh, directly to the question uh, of uh, of how this enumerated powers uh, enumeration of powers. Uh, in the constitutional text was understood when this question was directly before uh, the people, and it suggests to me that uh, there really was a lot of indeterminacy uh, on that uh, question. I don't think uh, that the appearance of the words the United States uh, in the preamble um, uh, in any way um, folds that background uh, understanding uh, or context uh, into the semantic meaning of the text, if that was uh, part of your suggestion. I don't think that, I mean, the semantic meaning of the United States uh, uh, seems to me not to include uh, the this kind of general background uh, context of the Revolutionary uh, War, uh, if we're talking about original public meaning, originalism. Uh, I just want to say that I would, if I, this were a courtroom, I would object to everything that David said about the about Madison's notes and the founders' intentions and what they were really up to on grounds of lack of materiality. Um, it doesn't pertain to the thesis, their thesis of their paper, which has to do with the public meaning um, and the existence of ambiguity. So I just would object to it on that grounds and ask that it be stricken from the record. Thank you. I, I love this in part because my constitutional law teacher's constitutional law teacher was Krosky. And my question is, about inherent national sovereignty as it might play into the second necessary and proper clause. And I wonder whether the anti-federalists were concerned about a possible linguistic meaning such that their concerns showed it was somewhat plausible, or rather they were thinking about James Wilson and the Bank of North America and the claim that the political act of creating a certain kind of political institution had consequences for the powers of that political institution, a claim that Wilson made under the Confederation before there was a Constitution. That question, it would astound almost every other country on Earth, literally every country on Earth, that we would try to understand that question through the lens of 1789 or 1791. No other country would do that. It's a crazy question. It is so essential to how we rule ourselves so in that sense, it made me sad that we can't argue about this as to which would be better. Would it be better to have a federal government of unlimited powers, or would it be better not to? Um, so that's one comment. The question is, there are people in this room, Larry, Elon, uh, Steve Calabresia said this, that said that under original public meaning, uh, original, the application of the original meaning, even if known, can change if Relevant facts change, or in Larry's words, I'm going to say this every year I come here until he takes it back, beliefs about facts change. 
So the fa that's Larry's word. So they all agree that gender discrimination is subject to the 14th Amendment because they had the facts wrong about women, even though we know for 100% certainty they didn't think that in 1868. My question is this. <laughs> um, the Founding Fathers are looking at it, a country of 13 eastern colonies or states, um, a geographical area that is one-tenth or something of the entire country, not to mention Alaska, Hawaii, Guam, and Puerto Rico. <laughs> the relevant facts have changed. The needs for a national government with unlimited power may be a necessity, or maybe it's not. But whatever the answer to that question is, the relevant facts have changed since, since 1791. And once originalists, public meaning originalists, like Larry and Alon um, and Steve Calabresi, say that applications can change if relevant facts change or beliefs about facts change, then I think you guys should put an instrumental kind of non-originalist argument in this paper because, in my opinion, non-originalist arguments make their way into these types of things and say we'd be better off with a federal government that can do these things. And that's okay because the facts have changed. Just like we protect women under the 14th Amendment, which we didn't do in, 19, in the 1940s in this country because facts have changed. I, I can tell the professors Cohn and Schwartz from the conclusion are deeply concerned, I mean, horrified is not too strong a word, about where the current Supreme Court may go with this most conservative majority in decades and an originalist plus fellow traveler, perhaps, majority. Um, and, and they're deeply worried about the idea that enumerationism could um, take hold. At the same time, I, I, and I'm, I'm trying to square that the Professor Schwartz seemed to indicate, uh, kind of arguing that the, the Federalists who framed the Constitution kind of defrauded the American people and, and got through a nationalist Constitution under false pretenses, and which raises a question, should we be more horrified by uh, a, a conservative court holding them to what they promised with an enumerationist Constitution or by the original uh, enactment of what may have been actually a nationalist constitution. So w without imputing anything or assuming anything about the author's politics, I mean, I happen to be a political liberal, also an originalist, or at least a fellow traveler, and, and I happen to be an enumerationist, which may seem odd, but I, I think liberals should be horrified by the idea of a federal government with unlimited uh, non-enumerationist powers. The specific challenge I would make to the paper, just one, there are many points I could raise, but I just, I was curious, I would challenge the claim at the beginning, pages four and five, where, when the authors claim that enumerationism necessarily posits that enumerated powers, quote, are all specific rather than general. And I would just say as a liberal originalist enumerationist, I, I think it's, I think it's, it's difficult, credibly, to argue that the text does um, vest several very general non-specific powers. So I, I'm puzzled. I mean, I guess maybe there are people who think that the, all the powers are specific rather than general. I find that hard to square with the text because although I don't agree there's a general welfare power, there is a very broad non-specific tax and spending power. And I would say the, not the necessary proper clause itself is itself a, tr a textually enumerated power of a very broad, general, and nonspecific nature. I'll leave it at that. But thanks. A very provocative paper. I really enjoyed engaging with it. So uh, I, I want to quote um, an article uh, by Randy that he wrote with Evan Burnick called The Letter and the Spirit, A Unified Theory of Originalism, where he says that um, public meaning originalists may consult the drafting history and intentions of the framers because the framers, quote, might have special insight into the machine that they designed. Um, I say this because he, he moved to strike um, our evidence uh, of, of what the framers said at the uh, Constitutional Convention um, after uh, accusing uh, Andy and me of overly lawyering our argument uh, in our paper. Um, I don't agree with striking evidence. I think we should consider all of the evidence rather than striking uh, inconvenient evidence and it was a joke. Not, it was a joke. I, I joke, understand, yeah. but but it's not immaterial. It's not immaterial because um, what it's the, the question was: How do we know whether uh, the uh, Federalist um, debaters were being insincere? 
And so in order to talk, look at the sincerity of um, an utterance made at time two, you can look at utterances they made at time one in, uh, in different circumstances where they were apt to be more candid. Um, uh, on the point about, um, I also want to make one thing clear that the, the argument, uh, there's a false dichotomy that's often raised in this, uh, in this conversation, not necessarily today, but it did come up today, but it, more generally, the, and it's in the Supreme Court opinions, either you have a government of limited enumerated powers or a general police power with no limits whatsoever. And that's a false dichotomy because there's an excluded middle that I think is probably um, the interpretation that is most consistent with what at least the nationalist framers preferred, and that is limited general powers, a power to legislate, uh, to preserve. You know, this is really stated in the Bedford Resolution uh, at the Constitutional Convention um, to act in all cases for the harmony of the union or where the states are separately incompetent. Um, so basically, it's it's a limited general power to le- legislate on all national matters, not to legislate on all matters whatsoever, national and local. And I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. Um, uh, on the comment that the, um, I, I do think, you know, that we identify in the paper three tenets of enumerationism. Um, no general powers is one of them, that all of the enumerated powers are specific. And the examples that, um, that I think it was John who gave, um, well, we, there are, there's a general taxing and spending power. Yes, there is, but those are problematic, uh, for enumerationism. And so we had to have, we had to come up with these very funky doctrines that don't function very well. Taxing has to be revenue raising and it can't be regulatory. And, uh, spending has to be non-coercive because otherwise it's regulatory. And if either taxing or spending get regulatory, we have to shut them down and say that, uh, they're, they're not constitutional exercise. So those are treated as a separate case. And, um, and it's, uh, supposedly our doctrine takes the regulatory teeth out of taxing and spending, though, of course, as a practical matter, it doesn't. And I think that's another way in which, um, you know, enumerationism is problematic as a, um, uh, you know, as a description of, uh, of our constitutional history. I think the reason why we care about the, sincerity of uh, the Federalist uh, side of the ratification debates is not because it's their secret intentions or purposes that are really binding today. We're, no, what we care about is the original public meaning, but the numerous enumerationist numerous arguments about original public meaning depend on uh, arguments that an enumerationist understanding of the text would have been obvious, would have gone without saying, would have been taken for granted by any uh, reasonable reader uh, of the constitutional text in the founding context. And I think that the uh, Federalist secret uh, understandings of the text uh, and nationalist theory uh, of the constitution that they were creating reflected in text like the preamble uh, and closely linked uh, to the uh, ratification process um, uh, that uh, posits uh, a national people uh, who are ordaining establishing a constitution uh, as a, a collective, um, uh, really strongly cuts against uh, the argument uh, that uh, there was some kind of widely or nearly universally shared uh, understanding uh, that uh, the constitutional text would obviously be understood in uh, enumerationist terms. Uh, I think John raises a really nice point about the possibility uh, that uh, anti-federalists might have been worried uh, about the political machine they were setting in motion rather than uh, the linguistic meaning uh, of the text. I think it's really tricky uh, to figure out uh, uh, exactly uh, what uh, was motivating them or uh, the Federalists uh, in the ratification debate in many contexts, uh, although I think if you attend closely uh, to uh, the actual statements uh, that uh, the anti-Federalist opponents of the Constitution made, they are reading the text really closely and emphasizing uh, the language of the text. Does that allow us to say conclusively, definitively, uh, that what they were really concerned about was uh, the linguistic meaning uh, of this new document rather than uh, the political uses to which that linguistic meaning uh, might be put? Uh, I don't think it does. uh, uh, And uh, I'm open uh, to the possibility that uh, on some uh, further... uh, 
consideration of uh, of the evidence uh, that um, you know the the balance of the evidence might favor uh, the political fears over the linguistic fears. Uh, but uh, I think uh, that case has not been made, uh, to my knowledge, by any of the uh, enumerationist uh, literature, and uh, I think. There is a strong prima facie case uh, to believe uh, that at least many of the anti-federalists um, uh, understood the text uh, in a decidedly non-enumerationist way, that their fears were articulated in those uh, textual terms uh, based on close readings of the actual language of the Constitution because uh, that was uh, what they thought was at least a plausible, maybe not uh, the best, but at least a plausible understanding uh, of that language and context. Uh, my question is about the convention um, and the evidence from the convention and sort of how that fits into your theory. And, you know, as I understand it, in the Virginia plan, they propose giving the federal government the power to legislate in all cases where the states are incompetent. That gets voted basically affirmatively in Resolution 6. Then they come back with the set of enumerated powers. And then they have a debate about whether or not they ought to add a power to give the federal government the power to give charters of incorporation. Uh, and Madison says, that's a great idea. And Wilson says, yeah, it is too. Uh, and then they get voted down. And I, I'm not asking that in a way that, I mean, I think there are lots of ways where that's consistent with the theory that you guys have in the paper. Um, but I suppose even just taking the point about public meaning originalism, you know, I wonder about that in terms of them talking about or thinking about what enumeration means in a less fraught political context to kind of echo the point that Julian made. Um, and maybe that tells us something about how ambiguous the text is or not in a kind of non-fraught context. Uh, but just wondering, you know, what you guys think about that uh, and what role that plays, not so much for secret drafting purposes, but just in, you know, analyzing how ambiguous is the text really. Yeah, I'll, I'll be quick. I, I just wonder what we should make of the uh, remedial provisions of the Reconstruction Amendments. Um, at this sort of moment of, you know, profound constitutional reformation and centralization, we're still, I think, operating under the assumption that we need to add powers to the federal government to these sort of police these new general provisions. And I know you talk about the exception of race, but I just wonder if there's either that's this liquidation over time or if that is, um, you know, sort of a, an originalist moment in itself that we're... Uh, we're recognizing that foundational principle. So a number of the comments have pressed you on saying enumerationism is better supported uh, by the founding. I want to press you from the other dimension. Uh, it seems to me that the best reading is the anti-enumerationist uh, approach uh, and that you concede that it's ambiguous when you shouldn't. Uh, I think that, you know the two best lawyers at the convention are James Wilson and Governor Morris. Uh, they wrote virtually every clause you focus on. You know, Wilson writes necessary on the proper in the Committee of Detail. Uh, Morris does herein granted, and he does the preamble on the Committee of Style. Um, Morris is kind of unambiguously, everything should be the national government. Uh, he, you know, in his letter to Congress, you know, which he drafts, he uses the word consolidation. And he talks about the national government during the convention having the police power. And I think this is, you know, what they're intending to do. Uh, I think they're very clever. You kind of, you know, give the back of your hand, for example, the herein granted, saying that, you know, Hamilton makes up the herein granted argument in the you know, Pacificus Helvetia debates. You know, he rooms, you know, he's Morris's best friend. They room together at the convention. He's on the committee of style. Uh, when he uses that to read expansive powers to the executives, he's doing what Morris wants him to do. Uh, and then, you know, if you look at all of the, the big early debates, the Federalists are textualists, you know, and, and Madison is on the opposite side, and he's not a textualist, he's a structuralist. So, and the Federalists win all of the battles until 1800. So I think all of those press in favor of saying that really the, the anti-enumerationist position is actually the one that's most consistent with the original public meeting. I agree with Bill. Uh, and, and, and <laughs> Thank you, David. And, 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 and Bill should definitely be listed uh, among the, the scholars who are, you know, basically recovering the, the lost Federalist Constitution. 
Um, you know, um, w- why doesn't the paper say it more strongly? Well, it was a compromise between Andy and me. Uh, I wanted to be stronger on that. Andy wanted to be more cautious, bless him. And, uh, you know, we left it, we left a kind, we wrote it in a strategically ambiguous way. That's the two of us. Imagine the incentives for strategic ambiguity when you have, you know, 55 delegates, uh, in this high stakes, uh, convention. And so, uh, you know, there's a lot of strategic ambiguity in the Constitution. And I think that, uh, the reason that the word only doesn't apply in the, in the legislative vesting clause is a uh, part of that. And the reason why the, the semantic meaning on enumeration is ambiguous is uh, a decision to be strategically ambiguous, uh, which is a partial answer to Mark's question. Um, wh- yes, there is plenty of a- evidence of ambiguity. Um, the replacement of uh, resolution six with the enumeration is, um, you know, is ambiguous evidence. You can read it in both ways. One is because it, it lists are not inherently exhaustive. And we have textual indicators, both at the beginning of the enumeration and at the end, that this is not an exhaustive enumeration. Um, the fact that, uh, you know, there were, there were motions to be made such as to charter corporations during the convention to add more powers. And the, resp- the reason that they were voted down, uh, to the extent that we can discern it from Madison's notes is people would say it's not necessary. It's already there in some, you know, implied in some other power. And so, you know, again, that's ambiguous. You could say, well, that supports the idea of enumeration with uh, implied powers. But you could also say that um, there is a sense of some people that the more powers you add, the more it's going to look enumerationist. You know, that they try to literally identify every conceivable national power. I want to just make two kind of concluding remarks. The fairness argument keeps cropping up in our conversation. And I just want to reiterate, that's not an argument about original meaning. Uh, you know, fairness is not a linguistic category. Um, you know, it may be what we do with language. It may be how we respond to the misuse of language when something is fraudulent. But, you know, how does that play out when we're engaging in constitutional interpretation today in the construction zone? You know, maybe it would have been fair to some of the, ant- you know, some of the fence sitting uh, can, uh, uh, people during ratification to, uh, you know, to hold, uh, to interpret the, um, constitution the way the federalists said they wanted, you know, ar- arguably falsely, but they're dead. It's not fair to me. Uh, you know, I, I want my elected representatives to, uh, to have a law that, you know, um, gives a remedy for violence against women that, uh, uh enacts a, uh, an individual mandate, um, under, you know, as part of a healthcare proposal, it's not fair to me to interpret, you know, to punish the federalists, you know, who, who were making these disingenuous statements 230 years ago. So, you know, I'll lock horns in the construction zone with, uh, cons- you know, enumerationists about, you know, how fairness should play out in this. But fairness doesn't tell us what the words on the page mean. Um, the other uh, point is the is the unbroken tradi- the supposedly unbroken tradition. We have a historical debate. Um, you know, it's a thirty page article. Uh, there's a lot more to be said on both sides about whether, in fact, we have an unbroken tradition of enumerationism, how unbroken it was. Um, you know, and I think that's um, that is a, a conversation worth having. That is a, a an academic inquiry worth exploring. And we shouldn't just kind of broad brush it and say, well, you know, Congress didn't do that much in the 19th century. And we had this kind of, you know, they thought that agriculture wasn't part of commerce. Uh, there's a lot more to say on that. Um, and we should definitely be, you know, doing research into that and having some academic debates on what that meant. You know, unfortunately, we couldn't we can only kind of touch on it in this paper. But I do think that the idea of an unbroken tradition, uh, and we tried to say this a little bit in the paper, uh, but we didn't come close to kind of proving that point. Um, I think that that supposed unbroken tradition is highly debatable. I just have one last thing that I'd like to add um, in favor uh, of our uh, wishy-washy milk toast position uh, in the paper, um, uh, which is that I think 
there were lots of nationalist ideas uh, at the convention. I think nationalist uh, uh, figures uh, obviously played a, a hugely important role uh, in uh, the drafting of the document uh, and the impetus uh, for its drafting in the first place. But uh, the paper is very self-consciously focused on uh, the original public meaning uh, of the document, and I think it's extremely hard uh, to make the case uh, that anything in the semantic meaning of the text uh, conclusively or even strongly rules out an enumerationist understanding uh, of the document. And I think uh, that the vehemence with which uh, the Federalists pressed an enumerationist, enumerationist reading in the ratification uh, debates um, also militates against uh, the uh, conclusion that the document had a determinate original public meaning, just as I think uh, it would be um, uh, insulting in some sense to the sophistication uh, and uh, the savviness of, of the anti-federalist opponents of the Constitution to suggest that their readings of the document uh, were um, uh, absurd uh, or um, outlandish uh, given the context. I think uh, that the role that enumerationism played in Federalist advocacy of the document strongly suggests that that was at least one of the readings uh, in play and would have been re widely regarded as such at the founding. So if we're ta talking about the original public meaning of the document as opposed uh, to the energy uh, at, or the ideas behind its drafting, uh, I, will, uh, I will stand uh, by the paper as, as it's written. Uh, thanks so much, everyone. This has really been wonderful. Thank you.